uh, thank you, uh, uh, Francis. Um, you lived up to my expectations. I, I, I have always respected your take on things and enjoyed the discussions we've had in the past. And uh, you've had a very thoughtful uh, analysis, uh, which and you, I agree with you that the, a better discussant uh, in many ways uh, would be the theology-oriented people, the divinity schools, people of faith. Whether they agree or disagree, they have a common purpose with us because they too are under this secular, ultra-leftist, wokeism kind of a threat. So I, I think there's a lot in common there. I, I fully agree with you. <clears throat> so the, if I look at my uh, journey, I have written a few books, several books on uh, interreligious relations, which uh, being different was the main one, uh, which was directly an interfaith kind of a comparative study. And uh, Francis uh, played a very important role in helping discuss this from a Christian point of view and I, I was from a Hindu point of view and those videos are quite good. <coughs> but then I've also done uh, Indra's Net which uh, from a theological point of view uh, talked about uh, wh this issue of whether uh, Hinduism is a modern fabrication as claimed often or whether there is an ancient substrate. Uh, not the name or the term but is there an <coughs> ancient Vedic tradition uh, uh, of which uh, which has changed and evolved over time, of which uh, the Hindu dharma is, is a modern insta uh, instance of it. Uh, and I argue that the continuity is there and there is a common Hindu architecture uh, in, in that book. And this also <coughs> is, is a kind of an interfaith kind of book. And then I wrote uh, Sanskrit non-translatables. Now this is an interesting book in the sense that from, from uh, Francis point of view I think, because I mention, I say that there are certain non-translatable words in every tradition. There are words in Latin, there are words in Arabic, there are words in Hebrew, there are words in Mandarin, uh, which for which there is no translation because the English-speaking world did not have that kind of experience. And so the whole book is about the philosophy of Sanskrit words and why some of the mantric words are, you know, best left as is uh, when you are discussing English rather than translated, which is often the case. And I point out that Hindu gurus have been very guilty of this uh, in the interest of uh, building their market share and getting legitimacy with the Westerners. Uh, they've been translating these terms all, all over the place. And I also feel that if you introduce these Sanskrit originals into the English language, you would be Sanskritizing English. So the byline is the Sanskritization of English. So it makes a case that we should Sanskritize English, it will enrich the language with the experiences that we have in our culture. <coughs> and then there is this battle for Sanskrit, which is also an interface. Now this is the first time, this is a book which is uh, where I start taking on the secular academy. Because in the battle for Sanskrit, it's really the secular uh, experts in, in Sanskrit uh, in the West they are social scientists, they are Marxists, uh, they are removing the transcendence out of it, they are removing the, 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 the real spiritual claims out of it and they are seeing it as a structure of power, power play between uh, the elites and the non-elites, a system of uh, social oppression and, and uh, domination. So that's the beginning of this new kind of a thing that I, I got into. But before that, one of my earliest was also academic Hindu phobia, where again, using a a spiritual lens, I'm, I'm defending Hinduism from the interpretation using Freudian psychoanalysis. The whole Freudian psychoanalysis and postmodernism lens became very fashionable. Uh, it still is to, as a way to interpret uh, Hinduism. And so that was a, a response to that. So that, those are some of the <coughs> more, uh, those are some of the works that are more directly within the theology, uh, theology domain. As, uh, as Francis said. Now the reason I did this, the reason I felt it is necessary to do this is that uh, most Indians, and this is something in, uh, Francis I would love to have your comment, most Indians are concerned about the attacks from the church, okay, and I did, that was a thesis of mine in the first Breaking India book, uh, but lo and behold, <coughs> while those those uh, may or may not have been sorted out, 
But there's a whole new what I call Breaking India 2.0, which is nothing to do with another religion, but it is a whole new wokeism, Marxism, uh, Marxism through critical race theory in, turned into critical caste theory uh, has entered entered this uh, thank you entered this arena. So uh, I think that for Indians to understand uh, what is going on in the world concerning their faith, when in England there is a riot or when in Canada there is a riot or there is some people protesting against some farmers thing in India or the Kashmir thing in India. The tendency of uh, Indians has been to resort to the Breaking India 1.0 lens and to quickly jump and say this is the church doing it. And I feel that the reality is far more complex and far more nuanced. Uh, they need to understand the new emerging global left uh, that has actually started dominating uh, the way the social sciences are uh, taking apart and this whole business of uh, dismantling Hindutva and dismantling Hinduism. If you look at the signatures of those people, uh, I would say there's very few of those who were church people. They're, most of them are social scientists and many of them Indian social scientists, very diehard uh, Marxists and postmodernists and so on. So I am the reason I wrote this in this way is that because I've already written about the other issues, as I mentioned, and I felt that uh, these issues uh, need to be uh, need to be put on the table. <coughs> now, the closing remark that Francis made, I think, is very interesting. He quoted from the book where I'm saying that on the one hand, Harvard digests, Harvard digests Indian knowledge, Hindu Buddhist knowledge, and turns it into its own products. There's a whole lot going on with the Herb Benson Institute uh, in Ayurveda and meditation. There's a whole lot of research on yoga. There's a whole lot of studies on uh, vegetarianism. There's a lot of DNA studies on, uh, 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 on um, uh, you know, uh, uh, with artificial intelligence. And no, virtually no credit is being given to the Indian side. What they do is bring in Indian experts and treat them like native informants. In other words, they are translating the text for you and they are explaining how to use, how to use a certain herb or whatever and the, the Westerner is learning, replicating it, validating it, calling it his own and coming up with new jargon so they can hide the sources. So this is what I call the theory of digestion. Actually, I have a 10 volume series uh, coming up on this theory of digestion and examples from mathematics and astronomy and linguistics and all, <coughs> all, all sorts of things. So um, I think he touched on that in the final thing that to digest a civilization, you need to justify that it does not need to live because it has all these atrocities built into it. So the Hindu phobia justifies why I need to digest it. I have gone to lots of uh, yoga studios. Uh, I want you to, uh, to tell this to Francis. I've been to yoga studios where they've removed the, the Sanskrit terms and they have removed. The, these are old practitioners, teachers. They had all these gurus teach them at once upon a time. And they've removed all the authentic, uh, you know, ideas and digested it into sort of a Western secular practice. Uh, and when I interrogate them, they say, well, I don't want to be linked with a tradition that is killing Muslims or burning women or something. So they, the social sciences, Hindu phobic assault has worked. It has worked because now it's, it's justifying digestion. What it's saying is that a, a evil or horrible, maybe that's not the right term, but a, a really negative uh, tradition uh, does not need to survive, does not e deserve to survive. And therefore, we as the keepers of civilization will digest it and, and be the custodians in our own framework. And we are, it's better that all these things become part of our Western uh, you know, epistemology and ontology and uh, uh, technology and all of the, and, and patents and so on, uh, because in its original form it is so abusive. So the the uh, the allegation of social abuse and social justice injustice serves a purpose uh, in this bigger game of digestion. So I, I, that's how I feel. I feel that uh, the people, the real game in the end is digestion, and using the left wing wokeists to go and attack and dismantle. Uh, I see that they are being used as useful idiots because they are they are uh, uh, helping create the the confusion, the create the fragmentation uh, on which then the digestion becomes easier. So if you look at the way 
uh, a predator eats, the predator uh, removes all the things he doesn't even want, like skin and claws he doesn't want, he cuts them and removes them. And then the rest of the meat, he cuts it into bites that are easy to digest. So dividing the, the prey into manageable size uh, allows him to uh, ingest them. And then as it goes down the digestive tract, there are a lot of enzymes. So I built a model which talks about how uh, our tradition has been cut, cut apart. Uh, you, if you, you really cannot separate yoga from meditation and you cannot separate these from Ayurveda and you cannot separate the, all of this from the food chain. You cannot separate them from the sacredness of the nature. Uh, you cannot separate them from the nature of time, Kala and Jyotish. I mean, you put these as separate domains and put them in different departments in the, in, at a place like Harvard, what you've done is chopped up the prey into little pieces uh, so it does not have authenticity uh, to exist in its holistic way and now you can digest them part by part and and uh, and 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 then you bring in the enzymes which turn each of those parts into such a such a form that the sanskrit pandits and the indian experts can't even recognize what's going on so when i go to indian experts and say why don't you deconstruct what's happening uh, what i what i wrote in the battle for sanskrit why don't you respond I got a very, very top-notch uh, Sanskrit expert telling me that even to understand what this Sheldon Pollock has written will take me at, at least five to seven years of understanding, learning, I don't have the time because they're writing in very complica complicated language, they're referring to their own thinkers and we don't even know what they're talking about. So that's the problem we face that the, the linguistic framework and the reference points are, are in, in the digestion are so different that our people are aliens. We, we are aliens and foreigners in, a, in, a, in the study of our own tradition because it has been uh, translated and mapped in such a drastic way. So I feel that there is a link between these two things happening, the bigger game being digestion and I'm very glad that uh, uh, Francis picked on this particular quote. Now I want to go to the heart of the book itself. Uh, the book, uh, if there is a central theme from which a whole lot of ideas emerge. It's this theme of victimhood. The book is a critique of the way Marxism says a society consists of oppressed and oppressors and the idea is that you take the oppressed and uh, their narrative, uh, they are subject to this hegemonic narrative of the oppressors and so now we have to build a counter hegemonic narrative, the famous thesis there should be an antithesis to topple it and then the two of them will fight, uh, the two sides will fight uh, not accommodating each other. There is no such thing as retrofitting or modifying or accommodating uh, you know the, the dominant the, the existing structure you have to actually finish it, dismantling it. This, the whole idea of dismantling comes from there and this is, this is very Marxist as Marxist as it gets. Now the idea of victimhood uh, so this whole thing depends on, well, who are the victims? Because if this is a theory of be, people being victims, certain uh, communities and identities being victims, and then uh, how, to, uh, how to overcome this by dismantling the structure of abuse, then the question is, well, uh, who decides who are the victims? How do you decide that? So, um, the, uh, and what are the benefits? So there are four benefits that wokeism gives to victims. First, it says victims are a protected class. That's a Marxist idea that you mean that they have a special privilege. You cannot attack them, bother them, criticize them in the same way as you can do to the oppressors. So there's a law that was being enacted called against Islamophobia, uh, a law that would criminalize Islamophobia around the world, but it did not mention Hindu phobia or Jewish phobia or Christian phobia or uh, Buddhist phobia or any other phobia only Islamophobia because according to the people who made that bill, Islam is a protected, protected class and the other faiths are not. So I wrote to my senator Cory Booker, a very public uh, thing because he's the one who put it on the senate floor and I said, dear senator Booker, a lot of have, uh, have helped you, supported you, funded you including me and I'm very aghast that without consulting any other faith, 
you put something like this on the Senate floor. And I wrote a long letter and it created a huge traction and the bill has not moved since then. I mean, they haven't withdrawn it, but it, it hasn't been put to vote and maybe it's just sort of in cold storage. So that is one benefit that victimhood brings in this wokeism that, you know, you become a protected class. The second one is there's a difference between equity and equality. And this is a very important thing. Equality is the old liberalism which says that, you know, everybody is equal and then some people will perform better than others because of merit. So if you're having a race, a guy like me is not as athletic, but we all have the same chance and I won't win. And that's the way it is. But maybe in math, I'll do better than many other people. So the equity principle says that the outcome should be, should reflect the structure of society. So if X percent of the people in, in, uh, in a society are blacks, then we should admit X percent of the Harvard class. And this is the Supreme Court case now going on, uh, you know, that uh, the class should represent uh, this idea of affirmative action, which means that you want certain outcomes which have nothing to do with merit. Now, uh, this, by the way, was not liberalism of Martin Luther King. This was not the liberalism of John F. Kennedy. It was not the liberalism of, uh, of Jimmy Carter, uh, of uh, Bill Clinton, and even Barack Obama. Because they did not talk about dismantling structures of American society in order to get rid of white supremacy. They felt that the within the structures we remodel, like the Civil Rights Bill. Uh, the vocus say that the civil rights bill is not good enough because it did, did not dismantle the structures, it just operates within the structures. So in a way, it's accommodating the structures and it's, it's, a va it's validating the structures. So this is a second big uh, uh, advantage that you get if you are a victim, then you get equity, you get uh, rather than equality. The third is that the lived experience of the, the, the uh, uh, oppressed uh, is more important than rationality, scientific evidence, uh, uh, and, so, and so on. So when people have argued on merit that things like, uh, you know, uh, biology says that there is a gender is different, it is not like socially constructed, there is really a difference between men and women, uh, then, then this, is acute, this is sort of like, okay, this is not the lived experience of the trans people and their lived experience supersedes whatever science has to say. So this, uh, biz, the premise that uh, the lived experience uh, should dominate uh, in order to create a counter hegemony and the, the scientific evidence and objectivity, objectivity, rationality are all considered part of some, you know, white supremacy conspiracy. Now this is, this is insulting to Indians because we have had a tradition of rationality and, and, and uh, scientific inquiry, uh, 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 you know, and we feel that to say that all of this is basically handed over to the West and, and white supremacy is kind of denying the non-Western cultures that have made a lot of scientific progress. And then the fourth advantage is that you can cancel culture your opponents. And, uh, uh, you know, I have been cancel cultured in so many places and so many people are cancel cultured because the argument given is that the victims need to take over the narrative and the oppressors won't let that happen if they can speak. I mean, there's so many examples cited in our book where a person says that, look, if somebody in my class wants to, a white guy wants to speak, I, I have to stop him because it doesn't matter whether he's making sense, this, that or not. Because if we allow him to speak, he will dominate and the, 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 the reversing of the hegemony won't ever happen. So it, this means that being a victim is very, is prized. There is a victimhood Olympics. Uh, there is a victim or Olympics in which various groups are uh, fighting to get gold medals and become victim and so on. So if I could argue that short men who are bald and wear glasses are victims and I could give a lot of stories, I don't need to give scientific evidence and I, if, I were, if I had a big microphone and a lot of uh, important powerful institutions would back me for whatever reason and I, I, and I can go on uh, saying that this is my lived experience, it, does, it has nothing to do with your rationality and your data because this is my lived experience and then I, if I could classify myself as a victim category, then it would give me a lot of advantages. For example, the, uh, I just came back from Toronto and one of the big scandals going on is that there are Khalistanis coming to Canada as refugees on the grounds that they are victims of oppression in India. So there is a law that says if you can prove 
that your, you, you suffer and you face uh, the risk of death and you face uh, trauma uh, you know, because of who you are, then, then there is a special line. You can, it's a fast line you get in. And so since they have several hundred thousand applicants for uh, you know, visa, and there is a special express line for, uh, you know, victim line, they call refugee. So there's a whole lot of lawyers who are going to India and filing these cases. And so there is two parts to your case. First pass is very generic. All six, uh, they, they've done the research and proven to themselves and to the lawyers and to the immigration people that all six are being oppressed. All these, these peasants in the, uh, these, they're called jats. Jat is a caste. They, they say there's no caste system in the six, but there is, it's called jat and they are the farmers. So the jats are being prejudiced against and hit, there is hate speech and they are being killed and the police is doing this to them. All this sort of stuff is built up. That's the generic part of the exhibit. So think of it as exhibit one. And then exhibit two is if I'm the applicant, I have to come up with one or two instances in my life, whether they're real or not, but I have to say that, you know, so-and-so is hating me, my whatever, the neighbors might kill me, or there's all this hate speech against me on my Twitter account. I mean, I have to convince the uh, immigration officer that I'm at risk. So the Rohingyas are a group that have been identified as being people at risk. Now, the question is, will Dalits be on that list and then you'll have a huge industry to generate atrocity literature against Dalits constantly feeding it and there already is the industry but this industry will ex accelerate because the, the idea will be to prove that these Dalits are at risk and therefore the refugee uh, the laws of refugees should apply. So there's a law of refugees to cross that threshold. You have to prove you can't just regular guy can't walk in and say I'm a I'm a re I want refugee. You have to prove that you are being oppressed. So this business of becoming a victim, uh, a victim category, has reward, uh, financial reward. You can get into the nice country and live there, and there is a lot of middlemen, the lawyers, who make money out of it. So this is a scam. This is a scam, uh, and and who gets to be on what criteria you get to be a victim is often a matter of uh, the politics of discourse, uh, who, who has what kind of a power. Now, I want to raise a couple of spiritual questions, uh, and, and I'm in the process of thinking about these, but I raise them for, for uh, Francis to consider. One of them is, uh, you know, in Hindu thought, the ultimate person, the ultimate being, is an individual. It is not a collective uh, group that are sinners and not a collective salvation. Uh, each one individually has to uh, achieve their moksha and the, the karma is very individual. There is no collective karma of my family. I mean the point is I have my karma, my kids, my wife, they all have their own separate karmas we have to live. And so this idea of individualized karma and individualized uh, you know, Svadharma, my Svadharma is very unique and the individualized uh, qualities, you know, gunas is very, very individual and personal. So, whereas this whole wokeism works at the level of group identities, collective identities. So, I wonder how, uh, how it fits Christianity uh, because I will say that uh, President Macron of France uh, is totally against woke. And he's asked his uh, education minister to throw out all these American liberal arts type of uh, courses because they are spoiling the, uh, the, uh, the French youth. And the argument he gave is that in France, the idea of social justice uh, and freedom <coughs> is not at a collective uh, you know, level. It is at the individual level. The French Revolution, he says, gave individual liberty. It did not say Muslims as a group have separate uh, have rights. It said that every Muslim individually has rights. Each Muslim as an individual has the same rights as a non-Muslim. Each colored person has the same right as a white person. But it is not that you come and do collective bargaining. And I will not allow that. He's very clear on that because he says the moment we open the door to collective bargaining, which is what this whole woke uh, movement and uh, victimhood movement and all that is about, then you know you're going to destroy the country. He's very, very clear on that. Second issue related to this, which is also spiritual that I would like to uh, propose, uh, we discuss, <coughs> is that the idea that uh, 
some Asians are doing better in math. So this is because, you know, they're born in an oppressor community and those who are not doing well, uh, born handicapped in an oppressed community. Uh, why not? I mean, our view is that uh, I have a certain swadharma and my swadharma is, you know, I like math and I work very hard at it. But I'm not as good at basketball as a black person because he's much taller and the basket is too high for me. So I don't go around saying it is oppressive. oppressive. I don't go around saying that my lived experience in the basketball court is I'm being intimidated because you, the black per person, is actually taller and by birth you have this advantage and the game is actually in your favor the way it's designed. So maybe you should give me a lower basket so it's easier or a bigger basket so I can have equity rather than equality. I mean, I don't go around saying that because people would laugh at it. But when you think about it, why not? I mean, if in one instance, uh, Asians are better at math and they do they, they get in on that basis and in another instance blacks are better in sports and so they get into all the sports teams why would we why would we in one case uh, come up with this glass ceiling and not let a certain community advance because they are doing too well but we are not applying the same criteria to the other instance uh, so the Hindu view is that uh, everybody has unique swadharma and a basketball player's swadharma is what he should do and a mathematician's swadharma is what he should do and the musician should do music and somebody who wants to do gardening should do gardening. So then it's a matter of society allocating reward. That's the issue. It is not that uh, and Krishna is very clear that you should do your swadharma rather than copying somebody else's swadharma. Krishna is very clear on that. So to for, for, for us to have a to, to topple meritocracy which is karma based and to say that we will have equity of all outcomes okay uh, it, it shows it is a kind of it, uh, it destroys the whole swadharma concept because it says that uh, you know whether your swadharma is math or not or you know whatever you should you should be given equal equal outcomes this i think is a is a problem that uh, uh, you know i i would like uh, uh, maybe we can discuss what are some of the uh, what are the some of the ideas that uh, Francis has because I see Francis as a sort of uh, in this conversation as a collaborator he comes from another faith which is also being bombarded by secular you know attacks and they are more sophisticated uh, at dealing with it because um, <coughs> some of the attacks are genuine like Hinduism has genuine problems. So the church faced problems of sexual abuse, for example, and the church admitted it. But nobody said dismantle Christianity. It is not that you dismantle Christianity, because that would not be that would not work. And uh, the, the Christianity has a lot of uh, good scholars who, who take their argument into the social arena. And while they have theologians who talk about transcendence, they also have other scholars who talk about the social dimension, and therefore they'll defend themselves, and they have. So you don't talk about that part of it. Similarly, Islam has had so many problems and, and so many terrorists who quoted uh, from the Quran in order to do their deeds, but no one said dismantle Islam. Uh, you know, that would be considered Islamophobic. But the calls for dismantling Hinduism or Hindutva and uh, trying to play this game that they are not the same and so on, uh, does not receive the same sympathy. Uh, we don't get the same sympathy if we stand up and say this is unreasonable. Uh, we, we believe there is a justice in our tradition and society like there is in every other country and every other society, every other religion. Uh, there is no perfect one. But we think that this is an overkill and that's, the, uh, that's, the, uh, uh, that's, that's an issue that I want to uh, leave. The, the other issue is uh, I think the, um, uh, the, the, the idea of Hindutva has been questioned by theologians as you know not being genuine Hindu dharma. I mean Shashi Tharoor is a big proponent that Hindutva is sort of a fake thing just very recent and uh, we need to go back to Hindu dharma which does not have uh, the role of uh, you know society and power and so on. But then I point out that the Itihas, the Itihas is all about Bhagwan taking the form of somebody who has actually got to exert political power. I mean Lord Ram uh, Lord Ram has to go and fight, uh, you know, uh, and be a warrior. He's a Kshatriya 
and uh, in the Mahabharat, uh, you know, Sri Krishna is uh, advising and mentoring and coaching the Kshatriyas. So, uh, you cannot say that on the one hand these itihas are so important to us, which they are, and on the other hand that dimension of uh, Kshatriyata and, and hence Hindutva is to be negated and ignored. You can't really do that because then what happens is we would end up as more vulnerable to digestion if because we would not be defending ourselves. We would end up as people who are told, okay, now you just sit in your cave and do your meditation and don't worry about society, how it's run and who runs it and who makes policies and leave it to us because we've had a bad experience. We've had a bad experience taking the back seat in India for a thousand years being colonized. Our language was, the language was Persian and then English official and there were jizya attacks. There were all kinds of things that historians agree on. And since our, uh, our leaders did not take the social political dimension seriously, uh, we thought that we'll just be doing our mantra, bhakti, chanting and all that and let whoever comes rule according to their ideology, you know, we paid the price. Uh, so, we cannot let that happen again and this is my concern that we are now embarking on a new breaking India threat and a new level of Hindu phobia where the forces are using this new idea that I just described, a new kind of a poison and uh, using this to sort of, uh, 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 you know, pollute the ecosystem and confuse our youth. So, uh, finally, the, the term snakes in the Ganga uh, is a metaphor and not to be taken literally. Uh, the poison is this wokeism and this secular attack uh, against dharma and all the different dimensions of it that I mentioned. And the nest of snakes that I have talked about uh, targeted is Harvard and that's where a lot of snakes are being born and bred and injected with the poison you know and then they're sent back to India. Some of them go to think tanks you know, Carnegie Institute and uh, Brookings Institute and some of them go to Capitol Hill and they make up all these laws and then they then they put, uh, put all these sanctions on India, the threat and all that and some go to BBC and Washington Post and New York Times as journalists. So this, the, 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 you know, un uh, unless you identify where is, where are all these snakes coming from and where is this ideology coming from, you'll just go on fighting one at a time. You'll just find that every time you open a closet there's a little snake there and you won't know where the heck this guy came from. So, we need to fight uh, uh, the snakes in the Ganga uh, and by the way, there are also snakes in Charles River. So, uh, that's, uh, <laughs> that is what the book is about and I want to thank uh, Francis one more time and would really love to have uh, Francis your comments. Thank you so much. I'll just make three brief comments because I know there are others who are discussants going to get involved. One would be, I think, you know, that Rajiv's raising a host of interesting and important issues again. Um, two cautions I would have is one on, even if there is this phenomenon of victimhood, um, there is some value, for instance, to allowing, um, you know, the, the fast lane to refugee status for people coming from situations of violence and oppression. So the Rohingya peoples, uh, people fleeing Guatemala, uh, where there can be a dictatorial government, people being persecuted severely in their own country. I think this country in particular needs to have a sense of compassion and, and Canada too, for people in trouble. And I would think that the, the issues related to affirmative action and to balancing the spectrum so that people are not left behind in the countries in which we live should not come across as saying we don't care about people who really are victims. So not all victimhood is a social construction or political construction, but sometimes people are terrorized, brutalized by their governments and so on. So I think compassion is important. Uh, the second point I think is that we should avoid, precisely because the book is so correct about the power of political um, systems that push things in one direction or another, uh, the political currents around the world that sway things away from doctrines of truth and so on, is that we should avoid um, political identification with the right as well as the left. And that I think we see this American politics yesterday, the elections, um, and the, the whole um, you know, right wing of the Republican Party, everything becomes political in that direction as well. 
And I think that would be a mistake as well as the political drift of the left. And so to be rooted in tradition in a way that says politics come and go, but our tradition has something more to say. And then finally, thirdly, briefly, I just commend Raji for raising this very interesting point about karma, uh, individual karma, group karma, kula karma, the karma of society, and say that I think it's it's really would be heavy handed as some do to say, well, karma is obviously, and we don't have to think about what it means. Just as in the, the Catholic tradition, we sort out different kinds of sin. And so there's original sin, which goes back to the myth of the beginning, and that all beings are born into a world where sin is already active. And then there is social sin, that individuals born in their culture are either born into situations of privilege because of colonialism or depredations in the past, or extreme poverty because of people being robbed and ripped off. But there is still, as I think Rajiv is rightly pointing out, a sense of individual responsibility. And so the Catholic Church always holds too that, yes, original sin, and yes, social sin, but also the responsibility of the individual to do the right thing in their own lives and not to take that away as if everyone's simply a victim of what happened around them. But that's another topic for another whole discussion. But thank you, Rajiv, for amplifying your project and taking my comments so seriously too. Thank you. We are going to identify a couple people recognized. Can you please bring the microphone to uh, Dr. Uh, Yogesh Rati here on the front. And uh, I would request that, you know, many things have been already covered between both the uh, speakers. So if you have something that you would like to them to address, I will finally invite, before Frank leaves, I will invite them to, to comment on this uh, uh, three, four individual that I'm going to recognize. Please, Yogesh. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. So um, one of the questions I'm, I'm thinking about, and, and this is amazing amount of work. I, I did go through some parts of the book. Uh, it's simply amazing. Um, how do we, so, so for, for kids that are growing up here, uh, they are not so much um, nuanced into understanding all of the background that is coming uh, from India on all of these things. Because they are born and brought up here, they don't know what's going on and how things that are being discussed there, for example, caste, there's no understanding of caste to them. So how do we go about uh, sort of fixing this going forward is the question. Because the awareness is there, but how do you go about fixing this? My feeling is we should use Francis' time to ask questions that are for him. Yeah. Because I can continue later. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> thanks, uh, Francis, for your exposition on um, this topic of interest and relevance. Um, in the book, there is a mention of the Kwa movement and the idea of um, the, dissemination or the, the deconstruction of constructs, right? And yet the relevance as such of the constructs in a social context. Um, so there has to be a balance of sorts which hasn't, shouldn't be quite superficial, shouldn't quite be, um, you know, um, um, you know not, not fundamental. And in the Vedic, Vedic or Dharmic thought, we have uh, this formulation of how to kind of go about with it in a certain manner, uh, which is pragmatic, which is is uh, you know considerate of the realities as it stands in the empirical domain as well. So I would like to know from you, um, given this caste dynamics, given the race theory that we have out here, um, what is the way to transcend and yet not make it politicized and yet not make it weaponized in a way uh, which is parochial, which is you know, uh, not for selfish parochial reasons, right? Which is, which is for the sake of truly transcending the encumbrance of identities, uh, as some would put it. Um, uh, and I would like to know your thoughts on that. <clears throat> and rightfully so, that even Greeks and Romans got their math and science, and Arabs were the repository and providers. I think I'm glad that you uh, mentioned that. There's a missing part into that equation, that is Arabs got it actually from India. And that is the missing part, which I think equally needs acknowledgement, if not more, because the mother of that is from India. In fact, I'll give an example of that, not just by saying because I said so. Uh, of all the newspapers, New York Times actually wrote a one-page review, full-page review of a book. It's called Hind Algebra. It's actually an Arabic book, which was translated into English. That book was written in, I believe, 11th century. And it goes on to talk about this New York Times article talked about how great this book is, how it talks about all these different equations, how to solve all these problems. 
only one sentence in a one full page, that's a big New York Times page, it actually said that the author of that book, which was written in the 11th century, happened to mention that I learned all of this in India, and that's why it was called Hindi algebra. It originated from India. That's the knowledge. So the point is that it was conveniently forgotten that it originated from there. This is just a one minor example, and the list is long, and I could go on and on and on. But the point I want to make is that we are, we are considered, and I agree with Rajiv Ji fully, somehow it has been created this formulation that we, we as Hindus are inherently flawed. And somehow, this, the place we are sitting on, mother of wokeism, is actually inherently virtuous. And obviously, things have to flow the wisdom from virtuous to the flawed ones. So we are at the receiving end of every time, made to feel like we are smaller than that. And I think this got to change. We got to realize ourselves that we are not inherently flawed. Nobody is inherently flawed. Everybody has a right, equal right. So the dharma that, that Ajit talks about, we have a right to actually improve upon ourselves and do better. Yes, we have flaws, but they are no better, no worse than anyone else. So I think we should be loud and proud about it, as opposed to this wokeism coming down the pipe. And especially what what appalls me the most, this is one place where a third of the students are admitted based on something other than merit. Third of the students. Okay? And, and part of those third of those students are who gave money to the institution. I certainly couldn't have. I'm an immigrant to this country. My kids couldn't have. So my point I'm making is when the mother of wokeism talks about equality, not equality of opportunity, equality conveniently forgets at the time of giving admissions that those who are powerful, privileged with money are entitled to buy their ticket into this institution. And you know what, and I'll keep this short and I'm finishing it. Uh, what's really unusual, there are protests in this institution. I, I come here all the time. We have some professors here on our advisory board and things like those, so in our companies. So these students are protesting all kinds of things. And some of them are very good, but some of them are you know, kind of unusual, like fossil fuel investment by Harvard Endowment. Makes sense? I have never seen till to date one protest which says, why is it that the people with money are willing to, are able to buy their ticket into this institution? It's happening right under their nose. But till to date, I've never heard a protest in Harvard Yard where students got together and said, you know, people should come here by merit. Or even if the socially disadvantaged minority are given preferences, which I'm in favor of. But why money? If equality is an issue, why money? So the institutions who claim to be virtuous, inherently virtuous, teaching everybody else who are inherently flawed, is fundamental, it's a fundamental problem. If you got money, you can buy your way. If you don't have money, too bad. Yes, so that's the issue. So I'll, I'll stop you. over here. Thank so you. I just wanted Thank to make you. that point. Thank you. Thank you. Give it to uh, yeah. Mirnali Ji. Dr. Mirnali. No, no, that's OK. That's OK. We could see your yes. and matching with Rajiv. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. I have two uh, very quick points. The first one is uh, for both Professors Clooney and uh, uh, Sir. Uh, the crucial point I want to cover is it's a simplistic, simplistic exposition, but is there a potential overlap between race and caste? And uh, I have tried to examine it not with some hyphen or theory, but with an elementary form of questioning. Uh, using my lived experience as example to make my point. Uh, when we examine any question related to discrimination based on some form of hierarchical structuring of society, I uh, request please ask if it is just because. Like if I was discriminated against just because I was a woman in my home state of Jammu and Kashmir before abrogation of Article 370, the answer is a resounding yes. And uh, taking an example from our adopted home, when we ask if Jim Crow laws were a state-sanctioned abomination against blacks just because they belong to a different race, no one in this August audience denies the fact. But when I ask, are uh, the scheduled caste, tribes, and minorities harassed and treated as inferior citizens of state just because they come from a particular category, the answer is a no. On the contrary, Indian Constitution proudly enshrines protection for all these categories and minorities and grants them extra privileges, the group privileges, 
like the right to maintain their language, culture, institutions, in addition to universal fundamental rights granted to every citizen of India. So whether my theory is right or uh, uh, wrong. And my second question is the continuation of my uh, question yesterday about uh, uh, starting a counter narrative of uh, all of these uh, break, break, Breaking India voices. Uh, we have been provided a platform by our Honorable uh, Prime Minister uh, in the form of uh, national education policy. Uh, the state I work in, state of Odisha, with the highest tribal population, they have fantastic programs like 5T, uh, taking care of uh, a form of governance that is the example. And I will speak about it if I get a chance later. Uh, most of the progressive nations can do well by emulating that program of government of Odisha. But nobody knows about all of these programs uh, in US. Uh, and I also believe that social sciences education in US fills a considerable gap in India. And uh, may we use a new education policy and how may we use new education policy to bridge that gap uh, that is uh, uh, for Rajiv sir. And uh, how do we scientifically uh, rebut the fake scientific rhetoric that is being built up uh, in the US uh, against India, and as a government servant, I would like to seek your advice. What must we do to address this problem? Okay, uh, let me speak briefly, um, because the, these questions are quite wonderful, raising complexities, and to tr not to go through them tediously, but rather to take them perhaps together. It's striking me hearing them that from different angles, we are always living in situations of injustice, where there is ignorance abounding, and that we as human beings in a world that is imperfect are living in situations where there is immorality, injustice, and ignorance. And I think what it seems to me to be necessary to move along um, is a constant process of deconstruction that does not stop at some convenient point where I deconstruct them without self-deconstruction. And I think one could argue that one sees this operative even in <clears throat> traditions of, of, of India as, as diverse as Panini's grammar and Shankara's Advaita, where uh, what seems to be the case is deconstructed again and again, not simply to destroy it, but rather to restore the discourse by reconstructing after deconstructing. And that seems to be a necessary process. And the, and the trick that comes up, and I had alluded to this earlier, by not identifying with the political right or the political left, is because these political positions are in the intellectual framework substitutes for further inquiry and further investigation because they become theories and slogans and one talks about uh, this group or that group and then it becomes we're talking about talking about and it's no longer clear what's going on. So there has to be some process of opening things up with factual knowledge again and again Sometimes in disputes and debates on campus even, I'll, I'll try gently to ask the person I'm talking to, do you know what you're talking about? And often they don't know what, they may be incredibly sincere, incredibly committed, but don't know what they're talking about. And therefore on issues ranging from race to caste, to privilege, to uh, concentrations of power, both the people benefiting from it and the people who are outside may get caught into systems where the very need for knowledge and, and the overcoming of ignorance by interrogation gets lost. And you can see on the part of the outsiders and the oppressed that it can be quite natural that the cry of need and the cry of desperation takes precedence. But for those in power, it can be very sad and ironic if a university community begins systematically to exclude certain kinds of questions and not have the reading of certain kinds of texts and so forth. Um, and I think to, to really go beyond my expertise with a final comment would be to say, I think, and I'm, I'm not at all expert on Indian educational reform, Indian educational systems well beyond my period. So I'm talking from my own ignorance, but that what does seem to me for the past 50 years, looking at India, higher education, is that the humanities, philosophy and religion do not have their proper place on campus. And it seems that India does brilliantly with sciences, economics, IT, and so on. 
But in terms of where does one learn the darshanas, where does one learn to think philosophically, uh, to do the work of Vedanta and so on like that, it seems to be saying really under a British system, that kind of knowledge should take place somewhere else, but not on our campuses. And I could be wrong on that, but I think it has to be broadly brought into systems of education. And this would apply in this country too, um, that the, the voices of the humanities and the voices of philosophy, at least, need to be raised again and again, so that the conversation never ends with a pat, comfortable conclusion that suits me, so let's stop talking, or suits you, and then let's stop talking. So I'm sorry that's so brief, but I think it covers some of the points about the necessary critique and ongoing learning, if any of these issues is to be dealt with, not by some pat conclusion, but by saying over the generations, we have to keep fighting back against privilege and ignorance that deviously show up like snakes in the river. Uh, you mentioned that uh, it's very important to be humane and uh, allow all the refugees. How come that is not extended to all the Hindus who are being uh, subjected to so much atrocities in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Bangladesh? How come they are not given the opportunities to come here? Mm -hmm. Is there any other question for Frank so that he responds together? Generally? Okay, yeah, so any question that Frank can respond to? Okay, Frank, that was the only question. I just wanted to introduce the, the so that you know the perspective, Dr. Mirnalini Darshala, who asked the question about what can she do and she is dealing with it. She is a senior civil servant in Indian government. I mean, that could be the brightest people mm. that go to that category. So she's asking your help and yeah. Raju's help. Um, and I'm probably incompetent to give much help. So I, I'm not expert in, in the issues involved. But I think as was said earlier, that we can be you know, very sympathetic in certain ways and utterly blind to the suffering of others. And this can do with, you know, this kind of oppression is intolerable, that kind of oppression is intolerable. And I don't even see the fact why you think you're oppressed at all. And that sometimes can be true. Somebody can be pampered and feel oppressed when they're really not. But other times it is just a blind eye that the certain kinds of exclusion get ignored in the discussion. So this issue about uh, Hindu uh, refugees and Hindu victims of persecution, if we had a, a robust and serious enough understanding and respect for the human, uh, for human beings and all the religious traditions of human beings, then it would seem more likely that we would not say, well, these are victims and refugees and those don't count. Um, partly it's a compassion limitation. People run out of steam, but when it becomes systemic and said, you, these people are never taken seriously as victims, then obviously, again, the educational system, practically speaking, has to constantly raise the critique and it, one can be optimistic over the next hundred years that the voice of India in international politics, human rights, uh, pleading the rights of the poor will be louder and louder. Uh, that you know the, the rebalancing of the world that is going on will not allow the United States or more totalitarian countries to take the lead, but rather to allow India to have a, a beacon of hope and education that should be able to set the way. But so I'm not answering the question, but realizing that we have to be able to take that question to heart and, and have a sleepless night over it or something like that. I'm sorry, that's all I can think of saying. Thank, thank, thank you, Frank. We've got five more minutes. Well, Frank, Frank is still here. So you want to respond to some of the questions so that he also hears? Yeah, so Frank, the we're all for people who deserve refugee status, uh, but not for the politics that privileges some as more a refugee or a refugee deserving than others. Uh, and the, the reason I talked about the Jat Sikhs is that everybody in Punjab knows that they're very prosperous. They're hardly victims. They are the most prosperous farmers in India by far, uh, driving Mercedes and BMWs. I mean, if you look at material wealth, uh, and uh, they're, uh, they're, I think the Rolls Royce uh, company or some reporter said that there's more Rolls Royces in Ludhiana, which ironically is where I was born, uh, more Rolls Royce in Ludhiana than uh, anywhere else in India. Of course, I didn't get to ride in one of those. Uh, so they're hardly, there's hardly a case that they are oppressed and victims. They are very rich people. 
And so it's uh, it's local politics. They've come up with this Khalistan that there is there is need for Khalistan because the Sikhs are oppressed. Uh, so it is this. I think the pr person behind me was the previous question was saying that on the one hand, Muslims, I mean the Hindus in uh, in Pakistan and, and Afghanistan don't have rights. There's plenty of evidence there, and they are not qualified as and because they're not considered protected class and victim class. Where, where, whereas uh, Jat Sikhs are. So that's, I think, a comment I give that there is a, a irrationality there. Thank you. All right, we are nearing uh, the time that we need to end, but I think Dr. Goyal, you wanted to make a comment? Differentiate between a dharma, which is a pure spirituality, a perpetual spirituality, uh, spirituality is the sanatan, and don't confuse it with the religion. Religion is a practice that we do. The religions have been coming over ages, time over time over time, Christianity, Islam, and now we're seeing a new Marxism as a coming as a wokeism, as, as Rajiv describes so nicely, is a new religion in the making. We are witnessing that. What religion simply means they want to control the people. They want to create all kind of false perspective that you're doing. Just be educated, know what you're doing, you're dealing with. How you deal with it, there's a lot of different ways that he's discussed on it. But I think you need to understand, uh, the oppressed are being created. The oppressors are being separated. All this caste system was, was not the caste system. It was a system like you are a doctor, you belong to a professional society. If you're a labor society, that kind of thing. It, uh, people change the, from that to that. So what, what is the most important thing to know? We need to understand that. And uh, there are ways to correct that. The spirituality, the spirituality is disappearing from different religions. The one become more stricter, the spiritual in Islam is so low. In Christianity, the spiritual is being challenged by Marxism. That's why they are in trouble. Hinduism or the, the dharma simply means we are generic university of all the spirituality, pure spirituality. That does not eliminate you from practicing religion. Religion is any religion you can practice, any way you can get to the God, in darshan, whatever you want to do. That is your way of doing it. But the, 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 as long as your practice does not interfere in other people and restrict other people, when it does, then you can take your bow and arrow and kill it or fight for it. And that's what Lord Ram did, that Krishna did, everybody did it. When something Thank attacks you. your own power, you, you need to go after it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very Thank good you. comments. I, we, we have run out of time, so we are going to... Uh, I, I, I have only... You I just to want to thank yeah. Fran uh, Francis. I just want to thank Francis uh, for doing this. It means a lot to me as an author. Uh, I, would, I really respect your views. I take them very seriously. And I will dwell on all the things that you mentioned. They are very thoughtful. And uh, continue the conversation. Uh, when it's a little less cold in Harvard, I think maybe yeah. May or June, I would love to come and spend some time with you. And we'll continue this discussion. Namaste to all of you. Thank you. So thank you all. Yeah, thank you all for listening to my humble comments, and thank you, Rajiv, in particular, and Ram again for making this possible. Thank you. So I, I beg poor health that I will disappear, but continue thank the you. conversation as far as thank you can. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. I uh, I think that the not that it is not much to summarize, except that Rajiv will probably agree. Frank just gone. <laughs> Rajiv will agree that there are only certain corners where there are snakes. There are certain corners of Harvard where do not, they do not have snakes. At least you can be rest assured. At least one of them is Divinity School. You can go there. Um, I think the book has of many things that has been already written in there. It has provoked for people to think about so many other things that they probably otherwise would not. I think with that, only summary that I would like to give. And all of you have enjoyed the conversation of these two. And of course, have, some of you were there yesterday at, at Shrewsbury. Now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Mrityunjay Majumdar to uh, for the vote of thanks. For the vote of thanks. Professor Balram Singh, our most valued guests and panelists, ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion. Seldom has there been a more sincere representative of a civilizational thrust to counter a shadow intellectual and cultural war against it 
as Rajiv Ji has been for the Indic and Dharmic calls. His book with Ms. Ms. Vijay Vishwanathan called Snakes in the Ganga is a magnum opus on a concerted effort to undermine Indic and Dharmic perspectives by certain supposed spokespersons of liberalism as paradoxical as that may be. Being in this academic space, I stand informed of this oft hidden reality and look forward to working towards helping change this. Dharm has been the plinth of the Indic civilization since times of yore. It has encompassed disparate schools of thought from the non-dualistic Advait Vedant and theistic Nyaya Vaisheshika to the Gnostic schools that are premised on philosophical skepticism such as Ajivika and Charvak. It has celebrated the multifacetedness of reality and addressed the existential questions that we all face. This has been the way of life that has actively promulgated the idea of transcending the bounds of identities and ideologies, the binary categories even of existence and non-existence since times immemorial. Where it diverges, as Rajiv Ji beautifully puts it, from contemporary frameworks like critical race theory, while looking at moving beyond the encumbrance of an exploitation based on identities, is in its acceptance of pragmatism and significance of nuance in addressing the oppressor-oppressed binary. Postmodernism and Marxism were reconciled with the second wave of the former, which did not seek to dismantle all the meta-narratives, but only those that were oppressive, as determined by agents of that movement. How is this selective dismantling a consistent theory of metadynamics? Haven't the subaltern scholars become arbiters deciding what is oppression and what is not? Intersectionality is often touted as a pillar of critical race theory, but the applicability of the same seems to be persnickety and perfunctory. Intersectionality has become about accumulating victimhood points and certain concomitant myths about what coincides with the individualism myth. Intersectionality must be a concept animated by the imperative of social change, about mapping social hierarchies and mutually informing, thereby exposing multiple axes of power. What it has become is more of a weaponized tool of politics. Herbert Marcuse reinforced the idea of the zero-sum game, as Rajiv Ji again puts forward in his book beautifully. To give rights to the oppressed, they must be taken away from the oppressor. The movement of post-liberal, post-modern thought towards group politics and representation has led to problematization of all Hindus based on individual occurrence of caste injustice. There can be no excuse or leeway for discrimination or prejudice of any kind. But the weaponization of discrimination politics for selfish and parochial reasons is also not fair or correct. Specific instances of casteist discrimination cannot be reasoned to subvert the right to belief and existence of all Hindus who themselves have been at the receiving end of power gradients for sustained periods of time. Have you forgotten the extent of persecution and violence that Hindus faced over centuries? Or does that not qualify as being markers of the oppressed? From Pierre Bourdieu's idea of culture as a form of capital and selective second wave postmodern probes into exploitative power structures within history, to inconsistent applicabilities of intersectionality and Alison Bailey's epistemic violence, the book, Snakes in the Ganga, offers a wide and insightful sweep of topics of utmost relevance to Hindus in the modern world. While highlighting the importance of fighting prejudice and discrimination universally without needlessly problematizing any, any one civilizational paradigm such as that of Sanatan Dharm. On behalf of the Infinity Foundation and the Institute of Advanced Sciences, I would like to express my gratitude to Rajiv Ji, Professor Clooney, uh, who's left us, all our panelists and participants, for sharing their illuminative, illuminating perspectives with us on this August occasion. I would especially like to thank Professor Balram Singh Ji and Ms. Richa Gautam Ji for organizing such a wonderful event uh, at the epicenter of the perspective highlighted in the book at such short notice. The Foundation is thankful for all your efforts in making this a success. We are fortunate to have had uh, eminent academics, entrepreneurs, thinkers, activists, and social workers, among others, here with us. I would like to thank Dr. Yogesh Rati, uh, uh, Mr. Mukesh Chatter and uh, Dr. Minalini Darsala for their perspectives. Their interventions have enriched the discussion today. I would like to thank the team of Infinity Foundation, uh, particularly Mr. Biswajit Malakar, Ms. Divya Nagaraj, and Mr. Abhishek Tripathi for working day in and day out to ensure that the message of the book reaches all in sundry with the guidance of Rajiv Ji. I would also like to thank Mr. Abhishek Singh of the Federation of Indian Associations for helping organize the event. I would like to express my gratitude to the Institute of Advanced Sciences for organizing the event and Harvard Faculty Club and their staff for their cooperation and video service for recording the event. 
I would like to thank uh, Pramit Makore for, uh, of the Boston Center for Excellence for his significant contributions as well. Last but not the least, I would like to thank you all for being such a wonderful and patient audience and for expressing your support and admiration for this momentous venture to bring to light the growing problematization of the Indic civilizational ethos and the simmering of anti-India sentiments in certain academic circles with a hope for a movement towards greater empowerment of the modern Hindu and of India. Thank you. Jai Hind. Thanks.